As water rushes in, the fate of all but four men is sealed. Within 48 hours, their superiors will abandon them in order to save the vessel, and their families will be hung out to dry. The advent of torpedoes and electric power makes submarines an essential war machine. On the 7th of May 1915, German U-boat U-20 sinks the British ocean liner RMS Lusitania. By the beginning of the 1930s, it's clear that submarines will play a significant role in future conflicts. Towards the late 1930s, tensions between European nations and Nazi Germany are escalating, and the prospect of a Second World War is increasingly likely. In Britain, the Royal Navy High Command is acutely aware of the threat posed by the superior German U-boats, and is pushing hard to improve the British submarine fleet. In anticipation of war breaking out, 15 new submarines of the Triton or T-Class are commissioned in 1935 to replace the outdated OP and R-Class submarines that the British have been using. Each of the submarines is allocated a name starting with the letter T. HMS Thetis, or Her Majesty's Submarine Thetis, begins construction in December 1936 at the Camel Laird Shipyard in Birkenhead. The 82 meter long HMS Thetis is the first T-Class to be built by the Camel Laird Company. Named after Thetis, the mother of Achilles in Greek mythology, it's launched with a champagne christening on the 29th of June 1938. It's plagued with bad luck right from the start. During her first set of sea trials in April 1939, the first major problem is that the steering gear has been incorrectly installed back to front. When the helm is turned to starboard, the ship turns to port, and vice versa. Then, when preparing for her first dive, the bow planes, which control the rate of a submarine's descent, become jammed solid in the hard dive position, forcing the trials to be abandoned. One month later, the torpedo bay equipment is tested before the ship is brought in for routine maintenance. The torpedo room is painted with a coating of enamel paint. The torpedo tube doors are painted shut. A small mistake that's easy to rectify but isn't picked up. Towards the end of May, Thetis prepares for a second set of sea trials. On the morning of the 1st of June 1939, Royal Navy Commander Bolas navigates the ship along the north coast of Wales to a training area in the Irish Sea for their first dive. On the trip out from Birkenhead, Commander Bolas comments that Thetis appears to be riding high in the water and is heeling over slightly to port. On board are the crew, several naval officers including Captain HPK Oram, and the commanders of two sister submarines, Taku and Trident. In total, 103 people on board, 50 of which are passengers, including admiralty officers, camel led employees, representatives from other engineering companies, local ship's pilot, Norman Wilcox, and the caterers who are there to provide sandwiches, beer, and pies at a reception after the sea trials. Thetis is accompanied by a tug named Grebcock, captained by Alfred Godfrey. Two Navy men and two camel led employees are on board the tug, providing communication links between Thetis and Grebcock. The tug is there to make sure there are no other boats in the area during the dive trials. By 13.30, Thetis is ready for its first dive. The escort tug asks if any of the 50 passengers would like to disembark Thetis before the dive, but it's an exciting opportunity that nobody wants to miss. Thetis has six watertight compartments, starting with the torpedo area in the bow and ending in the steering compartment at the stern. At 1340, Commander Bola sends their diving coordinates to submarine headquarters, HMS Dolphin, along with a short message, diving now. Captain Godfrey on the tug Grebcock can see that Thetis is having trouble submerging. For about an hour, Thetis maneuvers around, circling and slowly settling into the water. On board, Commander Bolas discovers that the bow of the submarine seems to be light and no matter what they try, they can't dive below the waterline. He sends officers to investigate. The torpedo tubes at the bow of the ship are sometimes used as ballast to balance the buoyancy of the ship. Torpedo officer Lieutenant Fred Woods inspects the torpedo tubes one by one to confirm if they have air or water. He expects they have air in them because the ship's riding high. The way to test if the tubes are flooded is to open a very small stopcock in the torpedo tube door. If any water comes out, then you know the tube is flooded. 
When Lieutenant Woods opens the test cock in torpedo tube 5, only a few drops of water come out, which is normal for a torpedo tube. The inner torpedo door has been painted shut. The enamel paint is strong enough to hold back the water for the test stopcock. Lieutenant Woods opens the inner hatch to inspect the tube. The outer torpedo tube door is in fact wide open and the tube is fully flooded. As he opens the inner hatch, the door immediately flies open and hundreds of gallons of seawater pours in, flooding the torpedo compartment. Woods and other crewmen try to close the hatch, but the pressure from the seawater overpowers them. The sudden weight of the water rushing in, together with the bow planes being set for a hard dive, causes Thetis to pitch forward. It begins sinking almost immediately. Just before 1500, the crew on the support tug hear a loud whoosh of air and watch as the HMS Thetis quickly disappears beneath the surface. The commander aboard Grebcock is shocked at what he sees. Thetis's bow is submerged while her stern rises. That's not normal. Lieutenant Woods orders everyone out and attempts to shut the watertight door to the torpedo compartment. Thetis is pitched forward and the heavy metal door is now hanging down into the torpedo compartments. The door is held open by a latch inside the compartment and behind the door. A crew member climbs down into the compartment and unhooks the latch. Lieutenant Woods is standing above the torpedo compartment door. He tries to pull the door up towards himself. With the submarine's forward section quickly filling with water, the door's weight and the angle of the dive, it's almost impossible to seal the door. With the help of his team, Lieutenant Woods is able to pull the door up. But the door doesn't have one central locking mechanism. It has 18 butterfly bolts. Some of these bolts hang in the way and prevent it from closing. Each butterfly bolt needs to be opened before the door can be pulled into position and furniture has fallen onto the already heavy metal door. The team manages to secure only one butterfly bolt. They abandon their attempt and try to climb up through the torpedo stowage compartment and into compartment three, the accommodation area. Engine room crewmen Arnold and Cunningham, along with others, try closing the door between the accommodation area and the torpedo stowage compartment. But the crew from the stowage and torpedo compartments are still trying to get out. Arnold contemplates sealing the door and leaving some men behind to save the submarine and the remaining crew. He has the high ground and in a battle for life and death, he has the advantage. This type of difficult decision is recognized among submariners as a potential safety action. But he does wait until everyone's safe and then seals the watertight bulkhead. The two forward watertight compartments are fully flooded before they're sealed off. At the surface, the tugboat Grebcock hasn't dropped anchor and is drifting away from the submarine's last known position. In the control room on Thetis, the crew realizes there's another issue. Captain Oram orders blow main ballast tanks in an effort to increase buoyancy. But because of the angle of the ship, water is flooding the ballast tanks faster than it's being pumped out, so the operation is stopped to conserve resources. They also reduce electrical consumption to preserve battery life. Now, weighed down by tons of water, the bow sinks 30 meters to the seabed, plows into the muddy bottom, and they can't break free. They're trapped on the seabed 30 meters below the surface of the Irish Sea. Their communication equipment, the ASDIC, is a primitive sonar and it's damaged, so they can't contact the surface. They have to hope that once Thetis is overdue, help will be sent to rescue them. Royal Navy officers, having had no direct contact with Thetis for over three hours, are worried, so they order a search of the immediate area. The Royal Navy destroyer HMS Brazen, already close by in the Irish Sea, is dispatched to help locate Thetis. It begins searching the area and finds the escort tug. HMS Thetis is carrying enough air to remain submerged for around 36 hours with its normal contingent of sailors. But with the extra 50 passengers on board, that time is halved. The men stay calm, chatting about sport and the reception they'll get after they're rescued. But as the hours pass with no sign of rescue from the surface, Commander Bolas begins to worry about the dwindling air supply. On board Thetis, the crew outline a plan to help the rescuers above. They decide to dump most of the drinking water from the stern tanks. 
this will make the stern of Thetis buoyant enough to rise to the surface. After all, the submarine is 82 meters long and they're in only 30 meters of water. The plan works and the stern section of Thetis breaks the surface, rising well out of the water, plainly visible to anybody nearby. But rescue vessels are searching in the wrong location. Darkness falls and Thetis hasn't been located. As time passes, with no sound of rescue, Commander Bolas calls for volunteers to begin the task of evacuating the ship through the escape hatch. The crew have escape gear, but few are properly trained in how to use it. Of course, the 50 passengers on board have no clue on how to escape a sunken submarine. The first to volunteer is Captain Harry Oram. This might sound like a captain trying to get off the ship first, but this actually is a very selfless act. Captain Oram is the senior fleet officer, but he's not the commander on this vessel. And it's a dangerous operation. To exit the boat through the escape hatch, the escapees have to climb inside the escape chamber, then flood the chamber with freezing water from the Irish Sea while they're inside in order to equalize the pressure before they can open the outer hatch. With the submarine tilted at such a steep angle, there's no guarantee the outer hatch will even open properly, and the occupants could drown in the airlock. Even if they do manage to get out and make it safely to the surface, it's possible that there's no rescue vessel in sight. That makes it highly likely they could drown or freeze to death before they're rescued. Captain Oram tapes a message to his clothing, outlining the situation on board and the necessity of getting fresh air into the vessel. If his body is found, even deceased, he can still help the remaining men. Captain Oram successfully makes the six meter ascent to the surface where he waits in the dark, cold water. Then another sailor, Lieutenant Woods, makes it through the escape hatch and joins him. At least he has company. At 0700 the following morning, lookouts on HMS Brazen finally catch sight of the stern sticking up out of the water and two men floating nearby. The men are quickly rescued and they relay the news of what's happened below the waterline. Captain Oram and Lieutenant Woods explain the circumstances inside Thetis. Given the lack of air and the increasing levels of carbon dioxide, time is running out for those trapped inside. Early on the morning of the 2nd of June, the day after Thetis sinks, divers from HMS Tedworth arrive on site and begin to assess the situation. They report the submarine's stern is slightly above water, but the main hatch, which will provide an easier escape route, is submerged. A diver is sent down to try and connect an air hose. Unfortunately, the diver only has 30 minutes of air available and fails to connect the hose in time. On the surface, the situation is becoming more chaotic. Crowds are beginning to gather along the shore watching the drama unfold. The press is everywhere, documenting every development. On board Thetis, conditions are becoming unbearable as the carbon dioxide builds up and oxygen begins to run out. Commander Bolas orders men to try and escape four at a time through the escape hatch. It's a desperate plan to get at least some of the men off Thetis and make the remaining oxygen last longer. In the first attempt, one man panics as the chamber fills with water. He tears off his mask and tries to open the outer hatch before the tube is completely flooded, jamming the outer hatch. The crew then open the inner hatch and drag the four men back inside. Three men have already drowned. The survivor tells them the outer hatch is now jammed, making further escape impossible. Desperate to escape, two other men decide to give it a go anyway. The two men get the jammed hatch open and they make it to the surface where they're picked up by rescue boats. By now, many of the men in Thetis are either passing out or feeling dizzy due to the lack of oxygen. They're in no condition to perform simple tasks, let alone attempt to rescue escape from the crippled submarine. Another two men enter the escape hatch. The tube floods and they try to open the exterior hatch, which jams. The men in the submarine again open the inner hatch to pull their crewmates bodies free. But not only is the exterior hatch jammed slightly open, now they don't have the energy to fight water flooding through the interior hatch to close it. As tons of water fill the submarine, Thetis sinks back to the seabed. A private salvage company is brought in to assist with the rescue. They had offered their help early in the operation but were at first turned down. 
The divers tell the Navy they can cut into the hull and feed an air pipe into the ship. This will buy time to make a more comprehensive plan. But the Navy tells the salvage divers not to cut into the hull. The vessel can be rescued, but only if it remains structurally intact. Just after midnight on the 3rd of June, relatives waiting on shore are told there's no hope for the 99 men still in the submarine. On the 4th of June, the decision is made to tow Thetis with its crew still inside to shallow waters in order to recover their bodies. Of the 103 men who set sail aboard HMS Thetis, only four survive. The official inquiry decides there's no prior accident like it and so the outcome could not have been predicted. Without being able to foresee the outcome, nobody is at fault and if nobody is at fault then there's no liability and the families don't receive any compensation. Thetis is salvaged and made ready for active service. It's renamed Thunderbolt and dispatched during World War II. On the 14th of March 1943, Italian corvette Cicogna fires on and sinks Thunderbolt.